if I have this parametric curve what do you think that's gonna look like A circle, a cone? Okay, so you, you have uh, all named surfaces. Okay, but remember this is a parametric curve. So this is going to be just some kind of path through three-dimensional space. It's not going to be like a whole circuit. So it's not going to be a whole um, surface. It's going to be more like a rope and less like a blanket. Does that make sense? Okay, then, yeah. yeah. You're having a bunch of really good thoughts. You are. Um, <laughs> yeah, so what's, think about what this would look like if I took the projection of this curve onto the plane z equals zero, okay? So that means I'm just going to take the same curve, but then just set z equal to 0. So this is going to kind of simplify things. The plane where z is equal to 0 is also known as the xy plane. So do you remember from calculus 2? In calculus 2, if you had sine of t, cosine t, what is the shape in the xy plane? It's a circle. It's a circle, yeah, yeah. So um, sine and cosine is a way to parameterize the circle. Just to be sure, we can pull up Desmos. And I'll write sine of t, comma, cosine of t, and then we'll let t vary from 0 to 2 pi, and voila. There is my unit circle that I get with sine and cosine, okay? So again, this is, this is parametric curve calculus 2 version, where it all lives in the xy plane. Okay, now... Um, that's what it's going to look like if we take this 3D curve that I'm talking about and we projected it flat onto the plane. Now let's return to the original question. This is going to be winding in a circle in the x and the y coordinates, but for my z coordinate, my z coordinate is just increasing as t increases. So as t increases in value, it's actually going to go up in the z direction. So this is going to kind of form a, a spiral. Perfect. Yeah, this is going to be like a spiral shape, like the shape of a spring. OK. So let me pull out some. Um, the 3D Desmos. If I have time, maybe at the end of class I'll try MATLAB too. Um, but I'm just going to punch in sine of t, comma, cosine t, comma, t. So let me expand t a little bit. I'm going to let t not only go from 0 to 2 pi, but 0 to like 20 pi. 
so we can see more of this. And so um, if I just look at the projection of this onto the xy plane, it's a circle. But if we add the whole 3D element here, where as this curve is sort of winding around the unit circle, you know, the z direction is increasing as t increases, that's what we get this spiral shape. My curve is going up as t increases. <laughs> okay, so um, this is kind of all there is to it as far as, far as these uh, parametric curves go. Your textbook calls these guys vector valued functions. So if you see the term vector valued function, this means exactly the same thing as a parametric curve. So the reason that your textbook might call these vector valued functions is because we have one independent variable that is one input variable and my function is giving me three dependent variables Or you could say call those three output variables. So my independent variable is just the variable t, and my output variables are the variables x, y, and z. So again, you could sort of view this as a vectored value, vector valued function if you say some function of t gives me the output x, y, and z, which you could arrange as like the entries in a vector. And so this is why this is why your textbook um, talks about parametric curves as vector valued functions. I come up with another example. A lot of my examples involve sine and cosine. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not very creative, but uh, let's try something a little bit exciting. What kind of shape is this going to make? Okay, easy question first. Um, if you were going to project this shape onto the xy plane, what shape would it make? A circle. A circle, yeah. So, so the cosine t, sine t part still gives me a circle as the projection. So the only thing that's different about this is that I changed the z coordinate from just being t, just increasing as t increases, to now arc tangent of t. Does anybody remember what the arc tangent function looks like? No. <laughs> So that's important. Um, here is the arc tangent function. 
Um, few things to note, it's strictly increasing, but it has a lower bound at uh, negative pi halves. No, that should be y. And an upper bound at pi halves, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, basically, since the output of the arctangent function is bounded on the top and the bottom, then our z values are going to be bounded. This is a spiral that's not going to just go on forever, but there's actually going to be a top of the spiral and a bottom of the spiral. And so as t goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, your z values are really only going to go from negative pi halves up to positive pi halves. So let's try to see what this looks like now in 3D space. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and change this from sine to cosine, and this from cosine to sine, and then t is now arc tangent of t. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that t is allowed to be negative, so I'll make it like negative 20 pi here. Okay. So, um, you can see that it's like still spirally, still springy. Yeah, but the top of it is clearly at pi halves, and then the bottom of it is negative pi halves below the xy plane. Uh, and it sort of bunches up closer to the top, and it bunches up closer to the bottom. That's just because your function, your arctangent function, spends a lot more time next to negative pi halves and a lot more time close to positive pi halves than it does near zero. So your spiral is going to spend more time up in the top and bottom than it does near z equals zero. Okay. So, what if we try to change things a little bit? What are some properties of this curve? What do you think it's going to kind of look like? It, yes. On the z-axis, it will never be negative, because the e to the t function has to be positive. And so this curve is going to exist only above the xy plane. Very, very good property to notice. Yeah, yeah. So this curve is also going to live on a parabolic cylinder, which just means that um, if we were going to project this, we're going to think about the projection of this curve uh, onto the xy plane. Then the curve would be t t squared, and you could eliminate the parameter, just say x is equal to t, and then this would give you the curve y equals x squared, which is a parabola. So if we think about the projection of this curve down the xy plane, um, it should follow that parabola y equals x squared. And of course, then the z value is just the height above the xy plane, so the z value is going to sort of follow the e to the t function, which is going to be really flat and close to zero a lot of the places. And then it's also going to rapidly increase as you pass around the origin in the xy plane. So just to visualize it, might as well. Uh, t comma t squared comma e to the power t. Looks like this. So again, um, if I try to do a top down view, that projection from this curve onto the xy plane should look like the parabola. 
So like the green is my y-axis and it's upside down so that positive y values are down. And red is my x-axis. But then if I look uh, from this side, it should ideally look like the curve like e to the x, you know, exponential. And so all together, this is the curve that it makes in the plane, or in this in space. And it has all those properties we just talked about. Like to find the, the curve like in, in the 3D, like uh, I have a process, I have a way of thinking of it. You should take the x, y, the proje projection of the curve on the x, z plane, but in this case, and you take the plane, like the, the curve of that plane, and then you wrap it around the, the surface made like the par parabolic turn. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have the visual. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so. What else can we do to make this discussion interesting? Um, so whenever it comes to these vector valued functions or these uh, parametric curves, if you are ever asked to add two vector value functions, it works exactly like you think it would. You just add the components, right? You add the functions for the x coordinate, add the functions for the y coordinate, add the functions for the z coordinate. Um, These curves, we call them continuous if the function for the x-coordinate is continuous, the function for the y-coordinate is continuous, and the function for the z-coordinate is continuous, right? So uh, in Calculus 1, we tell students that continuity is what happens when you can draw the whole curve in the xy-plane without ever picking up your pencil. If you ever have to pick up your pencil, that's what we call a discontinuity. And so in this sort of parametric curve sense in 3D space, we call these curves continuous as long as you could like represent the whole curve with like one rope and you never have to like cut your rope, you know? So uh, those things sort of seem intuitive to me. Um, let's uh, see if your book gives you any other kind of examples to try to graph or talk about. Okay, let's try this one. So uh, I haven't actually applied to this one yet, but we can think about it together and see what we can sort of figure out. Remember that this, well, so I'll, I'll go ahead and label these. These is my x coordinates. These are my y coordinates. And then this is z. So one thing I notice about the, um, about the z direction is that that's just increasing as t increases. And so this is going to be kind of like our first example with just the spiral, where as t is increasing as a parameter, this is just going to continue to go up in the z direction forever. So it's unbounded in the z direction. In the x direction, cosine of t always takes on values between negative 1 and positive 1. Um, sine of t is always values from negative 1 to positive 1. t times sine t, that is not bounded because t is going to increase to infinity or decrease to negative infinity. Um, but I'm also multiplying times sine of t, and sine of t is going to be switching signs. And so while this is not bounded, the curve t sine t 
is going to look something like this, where it's oscillating between positive and negative, but the oscillations grow as t increases. And so it's really not bounded in the x direction or the y direction either. So I'm actually kind of curious to see what this is going to look like. Um, let's just go ahead and plot this and figure out. This will be so. Delete that and cosine t plus t sine t and then sine t minus t cosine t comma t. And I want to give t A lot of values, so I'll let it go from negative 20 pi up to 20 pi. Let's see what it kind of looks like as I zoom out. Okay. So, everything I said about it was correct, right? So, it's unbounded in the z direction. It just increases as t increases and then it decreases as t decreases. So it goes up and down to infinities. In both the x direction and the y direction, like we said, um, it's not bounded, but it also oscillates, like it changes sides. If you think about this curve as t increases, it's going back and forth in the y direction, but the oscillations are getting bigger, and then the same thing in the x direction. And so um, it kind of sort of lives on a cone. It's kind of a neat curve. To me, uh, my favorite kinds of curves are closed curves. And what I mean by a closed curve is like a curve where all of the coordinates are periodic functions. I mean, ugh, try to. Okay. Um, And not only periodic, but also uh, also continuous. So, like, you probably shouldn't use tangent if you want to create a closed curve. But um, any curve you make, and this might be a challenge for you guys to like go home and get on GeoGebra or MATLAB and try to like make a cool looking closed curve. Um, but any curve you make using sines and cosines, because those are periodic functions, they always come back to each other eventually. Uh, is going to end up making a closed curve. Like after some t value, the point in 3D space will return to where it started. At least if you're using rational multiples of pi as inputs to your sine and cosine functions. If you use an irrational multiple of pi, then you're, you're not going to end up where you started with. That's a whole other um, topic for another day. But uh, Let's say that for my x, I'll do sine of t minus cosine of 2 thirds t. And for y, let me just do cosine of t uh, plus, two, plus sine of 2 thirds t. And then for my z, let's just do sine of t. No idea how this is going to turn out, but the fact that I only use sines and cosines means that after some multiple of pi, these things are all going to end up being the same as they started with. So that guarantees me that I'm going to end up with a closed curve. And so, just got to type it in here, sine of t minus cosine of 2 thirds t comma, cosine of t minus sine of two-thirds t, comma, if you 
you add some combination of sine and cosine, it's gonna it's always gonna be a periodic function. Yeah, and and it sort of has to be because, like I said, sine and cosine are periodic. Yeah. You put Steve? Uh, cosine to minus sine. Uh, yes, for the y coordinate. Yes, that's what I did. Um, so let's see what I get for. Oh, I did plus. Okay, we can see what it looks like both ways. I'm just trying to come up with some cool kind of closed curve and see what it looks like. And so, like I said, uh, guaranteed if you use sines and cosines that like it eventually ends up where it starts and you get some kind of closed curve like this. So as t goes on to infinity, it continues to just race around the same kind of track. And so you can get some, some sort of neat looking shapes like this. Let's see what happens if I do plus right there instead of minus. See how that changes things. Okay, so that's what the plus looks like. It just sort of flipped it. Um, what if instead of two thirds, this were uh, two fifths? How does that change things? Yeah, it's still a closed curve. It's a little bit more complicated. What if I make it one fifth instead of two fifths? It changes the period. Yeah, it's exactly it's changing the period on that part of the function. Um, and let me make this two-fifths as well. Let me do something with the z. Make that sign of uh, one-fifth t, two. Ooh. <laughs> so anyways, um, it's not terribly important. Honestly, there's just not a lot of content in this section of the textbook. <laughs> 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 so uh, the last thing I want to do is I want to see if I can um, sort of uh, I want to see if I can make this in MATLAB online. <laughs> no, okay, so I'm, uh, on an exam, I'm never going to ask you to draw a surface, and I'm never going to ask you to draw a 3D curve. The reason I would never ask this is because I wouldn't know how to grade it, because I don't have, like, magic perspective, and I don't know what you're envisioning in your mind. So, like, uh, no, I won't ever ask that. The only thing I would ask on an exam and I am asking you on this week's exam, as I will ask you to do traces of surfaces, because you should be able to draw 2D curves and planes. Um, and I might ask you to do like a projection of a curve onto a plane. I'll ask you to draw stuff in two dimensions. I'll never ask you to draw stuff in three dimensions. Yeah, yeah so let's, uh, let's try to come up with a little MATLAB script in the next eight minutes. Let me start from here, save as, and call this plot parametric curve. So I'm not going to need the mesh grid this time. That's going to be unnecessary, because I'm not trying to make a surface. I'm just trying to make a, a curve. And so I'm going to let t, let me zoom in so you guys can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to let t vary from I don't know, negative 30 up to 30. And then now I have to come up with equations for x, y, and z that are functions of t. And so, um, like I said, for x, let's just make that, let's just start off with the spiral first. So we'll say, this is cosine of t, y is sine of t, and then z is t, like that. And then what I want is not the surface plotter in MATLAB, but I need some other kind of plotter. And I don't know what the syntax is, so I would go to Google, and I would say, Google, tell me what the MATLAB syntax for plotting curve 
in 3D spaces. And I think what I want is it called a 3D line plot, and so it looks like what I should type in is plot 3xyz. Let's try that. Uh, okay. Save it, run it, and see what we get here. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So, um, what I get in my plot is this little spiral, and that's exactly what I wanted to plot. So, very good. That is then. <laughs> The correct syntax if you want to use MATLAB online for these things. Eventually, I do want you to make sure you have a MathWorks account and that you can get on MATLAB online and that you're pretty comfortable using MATLAB for these kinds of things. Does it make sense, this little setup here for plotting curves? It's a little bit easier than plotting surfaces, even. Um, and then, yeah, we can uh, we still have six minutes left, so we can mess around with this a little bit. What if this is sign of. Um, one third times t. And this is going to be plus cosine of one third times t. That's a great question. You probably can't plot with it, but you could probably uh, do math with it. Let's open up the command window really quick, and let's say a equals one plus two i. Yeah. Let's see b equals 1 minus i, a times b. Yeah, so it looks like you should be able to do arithmetic with complex numbers in MATLAB. Okay. Um, back to this. See what's, uh, see what this looks like. 